Welcome to Condo Insider on Think Tech Hawaii. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm your host, Attorney Nalan. As all of you are still working through our New Year resolutions, we're so honored today uh, to welcome my former colleague, Attorney Veronica Nordai. Uh, she goes by Nika. Nika recently joined Pro Service after seven years practicing law. During her career as attorney, Nika practiced over five years with David Kilial Kupchak Haster's civil litigation dispute resolution team. From there, she served as a staff attorney providing legal advice and counsel to the chief judge and associate judges of Hawaii's Intermediate Court of Appeals. Through these positions, Nika gained a wealth of beneficial experience in legal compliance and advice that she brands as she leads Pro Services client training and development team. As we know, many uh, condominium associations also wear the employer hats, and we always need to be aware of staying compliance from the employment law side. Uh, so welcome, Nika. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Ra. Happy to be here. So before uh, we start the legal update, Nika, would you like to share with us uh, the HR services uh, your employer Pro Service Hawaii can provide, especially for condominium association clients? Sure. I mean, yeah, whether you're a condominium association, a small business owner, a big business owner, um, Pro Service offers services for all sizes of businesses. Um, Pro Service is a local, full service HR partner. Our goal is to give you time back so you can save time and money to focus on your business. Uh, we've measured and we can save business owners about 80 hours a month. Um, and our clients uh, receive a dedicated support team consisting of, among others, a payroll processor, benefits administrator, think healthcare 401k, claims adjusters, think workers' comp or TDI, HR consultants, think, you know, risky terminations or employee performance issue, harassment or discrimination allegations. They're there to walk you through those um, kind of sticky situations. Uh, we've also got HR trainers with the team that I lead in our training practices, and we train uh, your employees um, to perform their best as well as your managers to perform their best. We've also got CPR trainers. Uh, if you're an employer that they, you know, you need to meet certain CPR certifications as well as safety trainers if, um, to ensure that you're providing a safe and healthy work environment. So a lot, uh, we'd like to say that we've got your back on um, every day from payday and in between. So that's just a little bit about pro service and what we do. We do have some condo association clients, uh, but we do serve businesses of all types and sizes. Great. So as we all know, with the inflation and everything, uh, nationwide, the minimum wage has been rising, right? So Hawaii, where are we right now starting 2024? Yes. So we started 2024 with a minimum wage increase. So it increased on January 1st uh, from 12 to $14 per hour. So it's really important that employers have ensured that affected employees' pay rates um, have been adjusted as of 2020, January 1st, 2024. Um, employers should bear in mind that this increase also uh, means that contributions to Social Security um, and Medicare contributions uh, will rise in tandem with this rise in minimum wage. Uh, additionally, we also caution um, our clients um, to be mindful of uh, what's called wage compression, which can be created when we see this upward adjustment to the minimum wage. Um, and briefly, um, wage compression occurs when the pay of less experienced employees comes uncomfortably close to that of more seasoned counterparts or those in higher positions. Um, for example, in a food and beverage setting, you may have a server, a head server, and a banquet captain who are respectively earning $12, 13 and $14 per hour in 2023. Now, as of 2024, when that minimum wage increase kicks in, um, if there's no adjustments, um, they could all be, in theory, um, earning the same amount. So you can see that this minimum wage increase, um, you know, while it does affect the floor, you know, it can uh, ripple to higher positions and permeate through various levels of your organization. Um, so we want employers to be aware of that. Um, and employers can address this uh, by, you know, maintaining those pay differentials or providing growth opportunities um, to employees. Uh, and we really encourage employers to proactively look at their compensation structure and consider making adjustments um, where needed. And these adjustments can be implemented all at once. For example, you know, on January 1st, 
um, or they can be phased in strategically depending on the business's budget. These are all just the types of things that you know we advise uh, employers to be mindful of. Thank you. And uh, as we read the newspaper headlines, we do notice the trend that pay transparency is also sweeping across the U.S. and Hawaii has joined this wave. Uh, so what do uh, Hawaii employers need to know about this new pay transparency law in Hawaii? Yeah. So, yes, uh, Hawaii has followed suit um, from other states, such as, I believe, California, Colorado, um, and our state, but a big city, New York City. Um, so with respect to um, Hawaii's pay transparency law, or Act 203, um, this is a new law aimed at reducing pay inequality by providing more transparency, um, as it's called. So really the focus of this law is to create a more equitable and inclusive work environment where employees have a better understanding of their pay and feel confident um, that they're being compensated um, fairly. So Hawaii's pay transparency law has two primary components. Um, the first is a disclosure requirement, and the second is an expansion of Hawaii's existing equal pay law. So just very briefly, I'll, I'll walk us through both of those. Um, so first, uh, Hawaii's pay transparency law requires employers to disclose the hourly rate or salary range um, in external job postings. So think LinkedIn, Indeed, et cetera. And these posted ranges must reasonably reflect the actual expected compensation. So you can't just post a range of a zero to $500,000 on every job posting and, you know, dust your hands and say, all right, you know, I've complied with the disclosure requirement. I, you know, comply with the law. Um, that would run afoul of the law. The, the basic expectation of this disclosure requirement is that the employer will pay at the advertised hourly rate or salary range. Um, and deviating from that range, you know, makes expose the employer to some risk. So that is um, in brief the disclosure requirement. Next, you may be wondering, well, who does this disclosure requirement apply to? Um, and it applies to all Hawaii employers, unless you fall within three exceptions. Uh, the first are employers uh, with less than 50 employees. So this carves out many small businesses on, um, you know, and that may maybe a condo association employee and say, well, you know, there are less than 50 employees here. How does this impact me? Uh, well, it might because employees of small businesses still gain that visibility, you know, that transparency um, that this law is seeking to provide um, so they can see what bigger businesses are offering. So while you may be a small business and you may not need to post the hourly rate or salary range in a job posting, um, this disclosure requirement could nonetheless impact your employees. So it's important to keep that in mind. <clears throat> the second carve out um, from this disclosure requirement um, is that it does not apply to internal transfers or promotions. So if an employer elects to advertise a job internally, uh, they do not need to disclose the hourly rate or salary range uh, for that position. And last, um, this disclosure requirement um, does not um, apply to public positions where compensation is determined by a collective bargaining agreement. Um, and usually these public collective bargaining agreements are, are publicly available. So you could see the hourly rate or salary range in any event, but it is um, a third carve out. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll pause there now. If you have any questions, that is the first component of the pay transparency act this disclosure. In general, this is definitely a great news for all the job seekers, employees, right? But at the same time, you made a very good point about not necessarily if you're a smaller business with less than 50 employees, you won't be impacted by the first, uh, you know, portion of the law, which is the disclosure requirement, because your employees will be more savvy, uh, more information, access to what their peers are earning at other, you know, employer places. In order for you to keep your talents, you would need to match up. So that definitely uh, will impact employers across the board. And now we're going to move on to the second portion of law, which is the equal pay law. And different from the first portion, uh, as we mentioned in our prior discussion, that this will apply across the board to all employers in Hawaii, right? That is correct. 
So the second component of Hawaii's pay transparency law is an expansion of Hawaii's existing equal pay law. So Hawaii's existing equal pay law and this amendment to it applies to all employers, regardless of size. And very briefly, just taking a step back, Hawaii's equal pay law was passed back in 2019, and it is aimed at prohibiting pay discrimination based on sex or gender. So Hawaii's pay transparency law amends the language of the equal pay law to prohibit pay discrimination based on any protected class. So we're seeing a broadening of the protections under the equal pay law. We're seeing an opening of the door to claims of pay discrimination um, based on other protected classes, um, think age, um, religion, citizenship, national origin. So more than just your sex or gender, now you um, have a broader protection uh, for any of the protected classes. Um, The pay transparency law also amends um, what is equal pay law to require equal pay for substantially similar work. Um, So previously, Hawaii's equal pay law required equal pay for equal work. Um, So this change closes a loophole conceivably enabling employers to engage in discriminatory pay practices um, by making slight tweaks to work responsibilities and then discriminating against protected classes under the guise of slightly different work responsibilities. So the primary takeaway that we're seeing uh, with respect to this expansion of the equal pay law is that we're just seeing a broadening of uh, protections against pay discrimination. Well, as an employer, you must be wondering, look, if I have these two employees, one is a high performer, the other is kind of, uh, you know, just getting getting it by. Uh, so am I, you know, mandated by this law to pay equal pay for the same job position or am I still eligible or justified to differentiate the compensation or the bonus I'm giving to these employees. Can you help us clarify this point? Sure. And that is a great question. And in short, the answer is no, you do not have to pay all of your employees exactly the same amount if they're in the same role. Um, There are legitimate reasons for differences to pay. um, And the Pay Transparency Act does include some of those. And so I'll mention um, legitimate reasons for pay differentials include Uh, seniority, merit, the quality or quantity of production, um, bona fide occupational qualifications, or any permissible factor that is not a protected category. Um, So really the law is aimed at, you know, ensuring these protections against pay discrimination. It is not saying um, you can't have any pay differential. I guess from my HR training point of view, when you work with your clients, is it um, because of that, is documentation for employers even more important for HR? Because, you know, when things go wrong, when there are disputes, it involves facts, then documentation is always the best, you know, friend to really, uh, you know, have your case right there. So for lawyers like, you know, records, you know, always prefer clients keep good evidence to back up your claim or defenses, right? Definitely, yes. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Always something that we really push for. Um, Beginning from when you are, you know, creating the role and you're looking at, you know, the pay range that you're looking at posting and like the the services that this employee is going to perform in that role, starting from, you know, the very onboarding phase. um, And then as that employee matriculates and receives raises, just documenting the reasons for that, the expansion of their responsibilities, um, seniority, obviously, you know, you'd be tracking the number of years that they are with the company. Um, but certainly, yes, we prioritize and emphasize that um, our clients um, document um, everything from the HR perspective. I heard uh, there are also new protections afforded for workers who are pregnant or have unknown limitations or medical conditions related to childbirth. Uh, could you please help us explain that to the audience? Yeah, and this is something, you know, in Hawaii, uh, we are very fortunate that we have had a lot of protections um, for pregnancy um, and for nursing mothers, as I'll talk about shortly. Um, But this is at the federal level, um, and it's called the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act. um, And it went into effect in June of last year. Um, And generally, it requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations for a worker's 
known limitations uh, related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions unless the accommodation would cause the employer an undue hardship. Um, This act, in short, the PWFA, is administered and enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, in short, EEOC. Um, And I just felt it was relevant to note at this time because recently the EEOC issued proposed regulations clarifying the implementation of the PWA. FA, PWFA. Um, these regulations are anticipated to be published any day. Um, but based on the proposed regulations, uh, what we're seeing is that there are four uh, specific accommodations that the EEOC has deemed in virtually all cases will be reasonable accommodations that do not impose an undue hardship when requested by a pregnant employee. Um, and the applicant does not need to produce medical documentation to support these requests. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure employers were aware of these four quote unquote predictable assessments. Um, and they are allowing an employee to carry and drink water as needed in the employee's work area, allowing an employee additional restroom breaks, um, allowing an employee whose work requires sitting to stand or vice versa, whose work requires standing to sit. And lastly, allowing the employee breaks as needed to eat um, and drink. So we just want to make sure that th- that this act and these predictable assessments are on uh, employers' radars um, and they can make sure to revisit their policies and forms to ensure um, that the language that they have in their handbooks are consistent uh, with the EEOC regulations implementing the PWFA. Okay, and uh, for nursing mothers who are in the workforce, uh, there are also special protections in place now, right? Yes, um, and so and there have been, um, but this Pump Act, or Providing Urgent Maternal Protections for Nursing Mothers Act, uh, expands the protections for nursing mothers to exempt employees. On uh, this is a federal um, law, as is PWFA. Uh, Hawaii has a state law also protecting um, mothers expressing milk in the workplace. Um, but with respect to pump, um, it requires employers to provide reasonable break time for mothers to express work in a location uh, that is not the restroom and it is shielded from view and from intrusion from coworkers or the public for up to one year after uh, the child's birth. And note, this applies to both remote employees and employees that are in the office. With respect to work employees, you know, you think of situations if you're required to be in a Zoom meeting, on camera, you know, you need to make sure that you have accommodations to provide um, that nursing mother breaks and privacy um, during those breaks. And PUMP um, is enforced by the Department of Labor. So it's got a different federal agency that's enforcing um, it. But, but that said, both PUMP and the PWFA um, do overlap in in the individuals that may be impacted by them. Uh, And both the EEOC and the Department of Labor um, collectively uh, issued a joint memorandum of understanding, um, just informing the public that they would combine their efforts um, to address violations under either statute. So while they are, you know, separate federal statutes that are overseen by separate federal agencies, um, there is some overlap in potential investigations that could arise under them. There's there's um, some communication between the agency with respect to these two. And I think, you know, just on that note, you know, the takeaway here with respect to PWFA and PUMP is really that we're, we are seeing a strengthening of these protections for working moms, whether you're pregnant, uh, whether you're nursing, uh, as a mom myself, you know, I think that, that these are, are really, you know, important laws that we do have um, as working moms. So it's it's nice to see. And I think that's just the takeaway that employers um, be mindful that these laws are out there. Make sure that your handbook, you know, is up to date and compliant uh, with the latest regulations, both at the federal um, and at the state. Yeah, I guess like even for the, uh, we just discussed about the P transparency as part of that is the, uh, you cannot discriminate against employees because of this expanded protected category or even for the pay, uh, you know, if you cannot justify the different pay for workers in similarly, um, you know, comparable positions, the EEOC could be the enforcing body and disgruntled employee could file a claim there, right? For our mm-hmm. audience who's not familiar with this process, 
uh, can you give us some general information about what would it entail, you know, the consequences for an employer who's faced with an EOC claim or even an adverse finding in the worst scenario? Yeah, so just at very high level, I'll start that the EEOC, it's a federal agency. It's responsible for enforcing uh, federal uh, discrimination laws, uh, including the the PWFA. Um, and they have authority to investigate these claims of discrimination. So the, the affected individual could, you know, initiate this investigation by informing the EEOC. Um, and EEOC will conduct that investigation uh, in all likelihood they will try to settle the charge and work with the entity uh, but if they're not successful the EEOC has authority to file a lawsuit uh, and I believe that um, you know the types of risk exposure that an employer is open to is both compensatory and punitive um, damages for violation uh, of these laws so there is an investigation process uh, usually some back and forth settlement um, process. Um, but at the end of the day, it's certainly a risk uh, if the employer does not comply. Um, and just from a general perspective, um, you know, all employers should um, comply with the PWFA. Um, so yeah, and I would say just on that note, at a local level, uh, we have the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission uh, and Pro Service provides uh, HR consultants um, on its staff that are there um, to hold employers' hands on um, if they ever, you know, receive a notice from the HCRC, which is, you know, the local level um, agency that does handle some of these discrimination um, complaints. Uh, we can work with those employers to respond to the complaints. Um, and, um, you know, at some, at some points we do get third-party legal counsel involved. Other times we can just be the the consultant, the sounding board. You know that your HR consultant isn't your personal attorney, um, but they are very knowledgeable in the laws, and they are there for any of our pro service clients um, to provide guidance um, and just information uh, about what the laws are and the best practices are. Uh, and certainly, you know, if we are seeing these um, issues arise from a client perspective, you know, we also have our trainers on board, so we go out and provide training to the supervisor or manager to make sure they are up to date on the law um, and, you know, train it at the manager level as well as at the employee level. Uh, so all these laws and regulations, you know, keeping up with them, uh, knowing who's the agency that's overseeing them, it can get very confusing. At, but if you are one of our pro service partners, we really try to make it as easy as possible for you. We have a team available to help you uh, navigate these waters. That's great. We've covered a lot of information, I guess, for employers, uh, you know, as the beginning of the new year, if you have not done so already, it would be a good timing to either update your employee handbook or revisit your office policies to make sure you're in legal compliance. So we have a few minutes left. And Nika, would you want to uh, wrap up, or sort of give our audience a, a takeaway, you know, because our these days our attention span is always short. It's always nice if, you know, if somebody doesn't have the time to go through our whole show, what would be the takeaways they can gather at the end of the show? Sure. Um, just in brief summary, the takeaways um, from today's show, uh, Na and I covered um, the increase to the minimum wage in Hawaii, which increased on January 1st, 2024 from $12 an hour um, to $14 an hour. So please ensure um, that any affected employees uh, pay has been adjusted to meet this new minimum wage requirement. Uh, second, we over, over, went over uh, Hawaii's Pay Transparency Act. Uh, there's two components to that. The disclosure requirement, uh, which requires employers to disclose the hourly rate or salary range in external job postings. Uh, and this applies to employers with more than 50 employees. Uh, it does not apply to... Um, it does not apply to internal job postings, and it does not apply to public positions um, whose compensation is determined by a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, the second component of, of the Pay Transparency Act is an expansion of Hawaii's equal pay law. So we're seeing a broadening of protections against pay discrimination. Uh, and last, we went over two federal laws, which are expanding protections uh, for pregnant mothers and for nursing mothers, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, uh, as well as the pump. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, Nika.
Of course. Thank you for having me. It's great to chat with you all today.